this uh, webinar from the Trinity series. Uh, first of all, uh, Emmanuel can't be here today. He has to be at the university. There's a big event uh, concerning a research center. He has to be present. Um, welcome to Klaus Adam. So for the first time, the presenter will be actually in our room. So he's sitting just to the left of me. Uh, I guess you all know Klaus, so no further introduction needed. One hour for you, Klaus. Okay. Let's go. Thanks a lot. So welcome everybody on the screen. So uh, let's try to make this a little bit interactive to the extent we can. I think this should be working fine, given the relatively small numbers here in attendance. So please feel free to interrupt any time. So this is a joint work uh, with Michael Woodford, and it's about whether, whether or not uh, monetary policy should lean against asset price, in particular house price movement. That's of course you know, um, a classic question that has been looked at uh, for quite a while. And the standard approach of many central banks is to look at uh, forecasts of inflation and the output gap uh, and try to assess uh, how, uh, based on those forecasts, they would ideally choose their interest rates jointly with the outcomes produced for those variables. And of course, asset prices are one variable that should be taken into account uh, for assessing, say, demand conditions in the economy. And if you look a little bit before the financial crisis, um, the consensus view at central banks, certainly at the Federal Reserve Bank, if you heard people like Don Cohn or so on before uh, 2007, uh, they were going around basically motivated by the experience of the uh, stock market crash in the year 2000s that central, you know, asset prices are of no particular concern for central banks. Uh, it's just one of many informative variables to assess, you know, demand or inflationary pressures as a result. And uh, to the extent that then the policy instrument at the central bank reacts sufficiently strongly to those demand or inflationary pressures, to those conditions, uh, there is certainly no need to particularly take any, you know, asset prices into account when taking, um, when making policy decisions. So there's no particular need why asset prices should be special. And that also, you know, is uh, the view expressed in earlier work by Bernanke and Gerdlop. So, and today this view is, for instance, uh, proposed in the recent work by Lars Swenson, if you look at um, his papers. Now, of course, the Great Financial or the Great Recession has uh, given us some new insights. Uh, and one of uh, the insights that we possibly can take away that, you know, uh, there has been a large asset price boom and uh, this asset price boom or housing boom has been partly, you know, associated with very optimistic beliefs about future housing prices. Uh, so there's quite some evidence now that um, you no know, beliefs about the future evolution of asset prices are not fully in line uh, with what rational expectations model would suggest them to be. So just to give you one example, it was certainly the case that financial instruments have been created in the United States based on the belief that in the aggregate, US house prices would basically never go down. Okay, and that certainly turned out to be a wrong belief. Okay. So May I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Maggie Jacobson from Indiana University. Um, so it seems like uh, Bernanke and Greenspan, they were both talking about how uh, housing was local markets in the U.S. And the work by Del Negro and Otrock shows that over time um, that there was sort of this movement where house prices were becoming more co-integrated and moving together and these local markets were becoming synced up. Are you going to talk about... Um, this at all or are you no we're not going to talk any about local interactions and how they became but it's certainly believable that that's something that may have happened based on the assumption that a lot of assets have been created on the notion that this would actually be not the case and okay. maybe you know those assets in fact may have just caused those increased co-movement in the okay. end uh, and then led ultimately to uh, its failure i think it could potentially be a great example of where the lucas, lucas critique could have some empirical bite, uh, but that's not going to be the concern. We're going to just take an act, aggregate house price movement as given. Okay, because okay, I guess I, mean, the I, I mentioned would be this only to as an example of. I mentioned this only as an example of where beliefs about how asset prices would actually behave turned out to be wrong. Yeah. Okay. Because um, I was going to say, going forward, it would really seem to matter if you're going to lean against the wind of whether you believe in this that house prices move in an aggregate or also are influenced by these local markets in the U.S. or what role that that would have. Yeah, I think we have here, you know, with a 
instruments that's globally operating in the economy, very little influence over local markets. And we're not going to look at any local heterogeneity. There's going to be one aggregate price index in, okay. in the model. Right? Okay, so then, so one question that you can then ask if you believe that you know these house price expectations are not fully anchored necessarily to what is rational the question is does that possibly provide a role for asset prices to play a role in the design of fully optimal monetary policy okay if there is some speculative mispricing of the housing stock could that lead to asset prices being somewhat more special than other variables and I want to emphasize this is now in the design of fully optimal policy. It's obviously very easy to write down as a optimal Taylor rule and then ask should we add other indicator variables such as house prices if you possibly find something. That's not the game we're going to be in. We're going to be designing the fully optimal policies and try to ask is there any role for housing prices. Now, it's an interesting and natural question, but uh, it's also a difficult question because uh, you need to answer a hard question when you want to ask about how to design policies in settings where there's potentially the speculative mispricing due to wrong expectations. And you need to answer how are the, what are the consequences of alternative policies that you contemplate to pursue for the behavior of those mispricing components, okay? Uh, and that's a difficult question. So let me tell you a little bit what has been done in the past and uh, why we think, uh, you know, there could be some room for improvement and then what we do in the end, okay? So there have been basically uh, two, three approaches. I'm going to come to the third one in a second. The first one is being, there has been this adaptive or least squares learning literature that sort of specifies some sort of econometric way of how people forecast and then asks policy questions. But that of course, is prone to a sort of Lucas critique argument. You know, it's always feel a little bit uneasy because, you know, the way people learn in those environments is invariant to how you design policy and it's not clear whether that's really a reasonable assumption. The other line of work is just to assume standard rational expectations model in which there are no bubbles, okay? Many environments do not allow for rational bubbles. And in those environments, we simply assume away any room for speculative mispricing. Uh, and so that, that's also not an environment in which we can ask this question, should monetary policy react to asset prices if there is some speculative mispricing? Now, this brings us, oops, now I've got them. Uh, okay, this brings us to one of the environments where speculative, questions of speculative mispricing have been addressed for the purpose of designing policy. These are rational expectations models that do allow for bubbles. <coughs> And uh, there's the work by Bernanke Gödle and uh, recent work by uh, Jordi Galli. And in these rational expectations models, you usually have an exogenously specified error process, which is actually indeterminate, that is capturing the bubble dynamics. Okay? And then we do comparative statics, taking this expectational error process as given. But of course, there's a multitude, in fact, an, infini an infinity or continuum of alternative equilibria, all of which are indexed by alternative error processes. And it's not clear how those error processes should respond once you change policy. In fact, it's not pinned down, and it's not clear why you should sort of fix or commit to a certain expectational error process, okay? So we think this is also problematic to do this comparative static exercises in settings with multiple equilibria. Yeah. So what we're going to approach, the, we're going to tackle the problem a little bit different. We're going to assume, you know, we want to do something which is called robust policy analysis. So we want to have the central bank recognize that private sector expectations may not be fully anchored to the model that the private, that the central bank is using to design policy. Okay. So think of yourself, you write down a model as a policy analysis analyst and you make policy recommendations, but you fear that private sector expectations may not be fully in line with the model that you use to determine policy. Okay? And then we want to design policy in a way uh, you know, that are robust to these deviations from the analyst's model or the, impl uh, the expectations implied by the analyst's model. But you do not want to pretend that the central bank exactly knows what the nature of the deviation from that model is going to be in the presence, you know, when it contemplates a different, a, a certain rule. Instead, we're just going to limit the bounds 
by which expectations can differ from uh, the expectations implied under rational expectations in the analyst's model. Okay? And this is the concept of near rational expectations that Mike has been using in his work 2010. Okay? And then we have a situation where if you contemplate a policy, there is a whole set of alternative expectations that are close to rational, okay, uh, associated with that policy and associated with that set of different expectations are different outcomes. So every policy is now associated with a different set of outcomes. And the question is, how are you going to evaluate those different set of outcomes? And what we're going to be proposing is that you sort of choose the policy that is least vulnerable to those expectational deviations uh, as, say, in robust control. You maximize the minimum outcome of the things that you think to be possibly associated with your policy. So and this is the robust component. Okay? So that's a familiar approach. Now, we have done that before in a standard new Keynesian model. So what is the news here? Well, the news is we consider here a new Keynesian model with a durable good, which we for simplicity call housing. Okay? And in this setting, house prices going to fluctuate for two reasons. For one, because there's news to fundamentals, say housing preferences, interest rates, and so on, but also because of speculative mispricing, because of expectational distortions that can be present. And then there is endogenous housing production. So to the extent that you have speculative mispricing, supply is going to react to that spe speculative mispricing. Think of, say, the housing boom in the US uh, up to the year 2007. You had the positive housing boom that was associated with a huge excess supply as a result in new, the new amount of houses produced. Okay, so we have that element, and that's going to be a source of welfare distortion associated with not optimal house prices. Okay, then also technically, relative to the earlier analysis, we allow for somewhat larger distortions of beliefs so that we have distortions that affect inflation output and housing price to first order, not only to second order. And then we have a new way of computing what we call the upper bound. I'm going to come get into that in a second. Okay. So before we go into the result, into the technical setup and so on, let me tell you what is the result. Okay. So number one is write down this new Keynesian model with um, for the housing sector. Okay. And ask yourself how would you like to implement optimal monetary policy if you had no fear of speculative mispricing. So if you were 100% sure that um, the expectations that, that the private sector entertains about inflation or housing prices were rational. And then we're going to get back a standard targeting rule that's going to implement monetary policy. You're going to have inflation needs to be related to the change in the output gap to first order linearly, okay, in this way. Uh, and that's just the optimal targeting rule in a model without a housing sector, okay? So the only difference is how this output gap is going to be uh, determined. So in fact, if you had no concerns about speculative mispricing, there should be no special role for housing prices in the design or in the communication of policy, okay? So it's okay. Uh, the standard model sort of generalizes under those conditions. But what if you were fearing that, you know, private sector expectations weren't fully rational? Okay, then this targeting rule generalizes to the following one. You have again inflation, and then the same coefficient as in the rational expectation setup that relates to the change of the output gap. But you now get additional components. The first is you get a component that reacts to the inflation surprise. And the second one is that reacts to the housing price surprise, okay? And in fact, under suitable assumptions, both of these coefficients, well, these coefficients are always positive, lambda pi and lambda y, they are both positive under all configurations, but lambda q is going to be also positive if there is an inefficiently high level of housing. So in a setting where you fear that the housing supply is you know, already high relative to what is optimal, say if you're in a boom, uh, in a housing price boom potentially, but in our model this is going to be because of some output subsidy or some housing subsidy, okay, if you fear that, then these two coefficients are going to be positive, and what does that mean? Well, if you get positive housing price surprises here in this last term, then you can do a number of things. You can either let inflation undershoot its normal target, well, in the absence of these concerns, for, Pricing, speculative mispricing, or you can let 
output on the shoot. So that means you're going to lead against the wind compared to a setting where you wouldn't have these two red terms. Okay? And of course, everything is symmetric. If you sort of had negative housing price surprises, you would become loser in your policy, allow for higher output, allow for higher inflation. So it's in this way that this policy targeting criterion would call for leaning against that weight. Okay? Okay, so uh, one more message. So you, it's the symmetric response that I want to emphasize. It's leaning against increases as well as decreases. And importantly, there is no need for monetary policy to determine what is the fundamental housing price, right? So it's just the surprise of houses relative to what you expected of them to be, no matter whether they're going to be driven by fundamentals or by speculative components that move expectations. Okay, so that is also sort of a usual you know, pitfall that the central bank would have to determine what is the fundamentally justified price if you don't have that. So I, I have another question, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, if, if, if the housing supply reacting is sort of seems like um, the, the main metric here, um, typically the housing supply might react with a lag to an increase in house prices because it takes time for permitting and, and, and building and all of that. Is that important for this mechanism? Um, well, not, I mean, well, that I wouldn't know. Here we have a contemporaneous response. If you think there is some persistence in the house price anyhow, okay, so mm -hmm. then that probably wouldn't make all too much of a difference, okay? okay? But here we have a contemporaneous response to the current house price in terms of how the supply reacts. You could think of, you know, this is the decision to start building the house and then conditionally on having started, it may take some time that we do not want to actually complete that actually that delay would actually not matter all too much okay 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 um okay so now um you know it's a it's sort of a technical paper uh, because of the theory piece so let me talk you a little bit through the relevant parts so i want to briefly define what we understand under the robustly policy optimal policy problem to get you know the channel approach over and how we compute the solutions. Then I'm going to briefly present the new Keynesian model with housing prices and again make a huge jump and directly look at the linear quadratic approximations to the optimal policy problem, once under rational expectations and once under these concerns for robustness uh, towards housing price and inflation deviations. Um, okay. Uh, we're not going to get to the numerical illustration, I'm afraid. Okay, so let's define the robustly optimal policy problem. Okay, so what we're going to do is the following. We're going to suppose that there is a policy commitment that the monetary policymaker has to choose from some, some commitment, small c, from some large set c. And thereafter, the private sector is going to choose some possibly distorted beliefs, and the distortion is going to be measured by that zeta variable, and it comes from a set of feasible distortions, okay? The first thing you need to make sure is that, you know, the policymaker cannot discipline the distortions by threatening non-existence of equilibrium, okay? So that's just a way of saying, whatever you choose, if there's no equilibrium as a result, that's a bad outcome for the policymaker, you're not allowed to take it, okay? And uh, this is what this makes, this assumption makes clear. So for all the commitments and all the distortions that we admit, there exists some equilibrium outcome that is consistent with the structural equations of the economy, okay? So these are oil equations, house price equations, and so on, okay? And then that means, of course, that whatever commitment you choose and whatever distortion stays, there is some outcome function that determines what is the economic outcome with that associated with that policy choice and with that belief distortion, okay? So then we have to say, what is the way we evaluate welfare? Well, there is some welfare function that says, you know, how we, you know, evaluate socially any outcome, any economic outcome, why? Okay, that's this thing. And then there's some measure of belief distortion that says, you know, how far away I am from rational, which would be the zero value, okay, given that this is the outcome and that this is the belief distortion, okay? So this is our notion of near rationality. And we are now in a position to define uh, the optimal, the robustly optimal policy problem. What does it uh, consist of? Well, you choose commitment C, and thereafter, some agent, some evil agent chooses the worst case distortions from the set of feasible distortions 
to minimize the social welfare, subject to the constraint that the outcome is given by this outcome function, which is consistent with the structural equation of the economy, and the belief distortion is no larger than some upper value V bar. Okay? So if V bar were zero, we would be back to the rational expectation analysis, right? We allow for no belief distortions, and you just choose a policy commitment that maximizes the outcome value under the constraint that you have to satisfy the structural equations. Okay? All right, um, that was that. Now, this is a very difficult problem, okay, for a number of, and it has a number of unappealing features. The first unappealing feature would be that now results depend on what we admit in terms of the set of targeting criteria or the set of policy rules C, okay? So we would get maybe that house price matters because we only consider Taylor rules of certain form. And that's somewhat unappealing because we would like to have the results that do not derive from such auxiliary assumptions. Okay? The second thing, it's a very hard problem to determine for all possible commitments what is the worst case belief distortion. Okay? That's just a terribly tough problem. So what we're going to do is something different. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to first compute an upper bound on what you can possibly achieve in this problem. Okay? That's somewhat easier to compute. And then we're going to present you with an example that is actually going to implement that upper bound. Okay? So let me tell you how we do that. Okay? Okay, so here's our robust policy problem again, where you first choose from the set of commitments, and then there's some distortion subject to these constraints, the outcome function, and the upper bound on the belief distortion. So the first thing we do is we write this as a Lagrangian. Okay, so we substitute the y in here, the outcome function in here, we substitute the outcome function in here, then we have just a problem with just one constraint, is this problem here, this is the constraint then, and we then write it as a Lagrangian problem, where the only thing that, you know, is a constraint is the second one, and theta is the Lagrange multiply on that, on that belief distortion constraint. And theta is now an inverse measure of the degree of robustness concerns. If that were infinite, any sort of deviation from zero would be infinitely penalized, and you would be back in the rational expectations world. Okay? All right. So this is just equivalent to the upper problem. Now, the first thing we do is we, and we invert the order of maximization. Okay? So this is zero-sum game, and it's always great to be the second mover here. Okay? So it's certainly a better thing to move second, so we can first have belief distortion chosen, and then have you know, conditional on those belief distortions, choose an optimal policy commitment, okay? So that's going to give a higher value, okay? Uh, that's why it's an upper bound. And then in a second constraint, we, in a second upper bound, we relax the fact that we are constrained by the outcome function. Instead, allow, like in any Ramsey problem, you know, directly the policymaker to choose outcomes themselves, okay? So here, you know, the outcome function could choose the best or the worst equilibrium associated with a commitment, okay? This is a matter of implementation usually, but he, to make sure that the targeted outcome is also the unique one, here we, in any Ramsey problem, we would just allow directly to choose allocations, okay? So this is a second upper bound, and this upper bound is much easier to compute, okay? In fact, we now have a second Lagrange multiplier that is associated with this constraint here, okay? That will be added to that. Okay, so we have this second Lagrangian formulation where we have this upper bound. You choose first the distortions, then you choose the, uh, out, uh, the allocations, and then there is a penalization in terms of deviations of uh, not so satisfying the constraint. Okay, then we can use this to propose a candidate uh, outcome. We can verify second order conditions. We do that in the paper, and then can propose a commitment consistent with the first order conditions of this problem, and then, you know, Based on that, derive um, uh, the, you know, of the proposal that, in fact, if you committed to that C that is consistent with these first order conditions, you get the worst outcome that you had chosen in this problem. And then we know it's an upper bound. Okay? So that's the general approach. Yeah. So I will not say more about that, but we're going to consider this upper bound problem. Okay? All right. So now before we go into the model, one more word about um, uh, the near rational belief measure that we use, we use a basic entropy measure as is used by Hans and Sargent as we've used in our earlier work. That's very uh, convenient, so we can represent distorted expectations about some variable x. Just a, yeah. just a question. Uh, 
Do you have any idea how far you are away from the optimum with this upper bound uh, stuff? Well, that depends really on you know that depends really on how big you choose this D bar. Okay, so the the or the, how large the Lagrange multiplier is. Okay, we can show you. Okay, we can show you for particular parameterizations, but in general, it's not clear to say. I mean, it's continuously varying uh, with the inverse of theta. All right, um, but of course that's a matter of parameter parameterization, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we can basically represent the distorted beliefs as a change of measure of the undistorted beliefs, and m is change of measure that distorts the probability over states. It's positive. It integrates to one, so that we have a distorted measure basically representing, you know, uh, distorted beliefs, and then we can, uh, you know. The size of the distortions we can measure by relative entropy, and then we have a discount measure of relative entropy that adds up all the one pair distortions to get the cumulative sum of distortions. Okay, and then we do one further trick: is it's, this is also somewhat a nuisance. We can sort of write parameterize now this non-parametric distortion by writing the dual problem instead of maxima. You, we can say what is the minimum cost. That you need to incur to achieve a certain amount of distortion. Okay. And then you can write the Lagrange multiplier on these constraints. And then you can write what is, you can represent the, the cost minimizing distortion as a function of those Lagrange multipliers. These are the belief distortion theta. These are the Lagrange multipliers on these constraints. And uh, then we can parameterize belief distortions by these theta instead of having to capture, you know, carry around these ends. Okay. And we can also write. The, the cost of belief distortions in, as a function of those data. Okay, and that's the D function, which is a function of theta and outcomes that I've been writing. Okay. Um, so that's the formulation we're gonna work with. Okay. Okay, so now briefly to the model. Okay, so the model is pretty standard except for the housing sector that we introduce in these belief distortions. So I've noted, you know, everything in red is the new thing relative to the baby new Keynesian model. So the first thing is households' expectations are potentially distorted, okay? So are firms, in fact. And the second thing we have here, consumption utility, this utility from supplying labor, differential labor, and then we have utility from the stock of durables that we interpret as housing, okay? DT is a stock of durables, there may be some demand shock on that, okay? Then we have a flow budget constraint, well, we can consume, we can invest in bonds, you can invest in housing. Housing depreciates at the rate delta. QT is the price of houses in terms of units of consumption. PT is the price level. And then you can invest into new houses. That's KT, investment into new houses. And then there is uh, some production function that instantaneously here, you know, produces a level of new houses that's then priced at the current price QT. And then there is this potential output subsidy, okay, which says we can move housing prices away from the optimum, okay? If SD is positive, that would mean we deem ourselves to be in a situation where housing is supplied in excess. And if the SD were negative, then housing would be supplied uh, to an inefficient amount, okay? Uh, that's just a way to get the distortions uh, in the housing sector, okay? We think that SD being positive is possibly the empirically relevant form of, you know, we have a lot of instruments that sort of interest, interest rate deductibility of interest rate expenditure from your tax income and so on. There are various ways in which housing is subsidized. Okay, so then in order to get analytic results, it turns out you know, useful to have a utility from housing that is linear in the stock of housing. And that's what's going to actually eliminate the, stock, the state variable dt from the problem so that we can still do closed form linear quadratic approximations, okay? And Xi TD is now a housing demand shock, okay? So we have this, this utility here, linear in housing. That's gonna be key uh, to getting analytic results, okay? And then we have a isoelastic production function, uh, decreasing returns to scale that produces new houses. Nothing fancy there, but we have here some housing supply shocks, okay? So, um, so we have basically two new housing related shocks, the supply and the demand shock here, and one new parameter, which is the housing subsidy. Uh, and then in terms of, um, you know, housing firms are pretty standard, these are Stiglitz, uh, sticky price and the immediate goods. And we have now a new market clearing equation, which says total output can be either invested in the consumption 
in some government consumption or into investment into new housing. Okay, so terminal goods are invested into new housing, okay, to produce new housing. And we get um, two new optimality conditions. The, the, one, the first one is the optimality condition determining the new level of housing, okay? So the housing investment, KT. That's gonna be a function of the productivity of housing, the level of housing. So if price, prices are upwardly distorted, so will be housing investment, okay? So that's the way through which house price booms or house price busts, distorted housing prices will affect the allocations, okay? So there's gonna be some distortion in the current house price. Where does that come from? Well, because there is uh, a surprising equation. Q -U, Q T U is the marginal utility, the, the house price in marginal utility units. So it's the house price in marginal utility units. That obeys a standard asset pricing equation that depends on the housing preference, psi T E, and the discounted expected future house price. So if this expectation is somehow upwardly distorted, people are optimistic, that's gonna to lead to an upward distortion of current housing prices, okay? Because people are willing to pay more in expectation of higher payouts tomorrow, and that's gonna to lead to an oversupply of housing in the model. And of course, also if this were downward distorted, and undersupply, okay? And then we have on top of that the steady state discussion. So that's the model, okay, in a nutshell. Are there questions on the model? Not, then uh, let's just proceed. So now I take a, a, a huge step forward. <laughs> I'm gonna present you the linear quadratic approximations to the optimal policy problems. First, under rational expectations. And this is just to show you why it is that uh, under rational expectations, these house prices do not generate anything new to the policy rule, okay? And then we're gonna add the robustness concerns. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna assume, they're gonna be small first order distortions to monopoly power, so the housing, uh, there's gonna be um, output subsidy, which doesn't fully undo uh, the monopoly power effects, okay? So there's gonna be a, a first order to first order housing output, total output is too low. And then there's gonna be a housing subsidy, which is gonna say the first order, given the level of output, we're gonna to have too many houses, okay? Uh, because we think this is the relevant situation, there's gonna be some tax distortions usually in the economy, and there's gonna be maybe some housing subsidy which is present in the economy. Uh, it could be a literal housing subsidy, or it could be just a boom where we already think we're gonna to have too many houses for other reasons, okay? Okay. So then this is the linear quadratic approximation to the optimal policy problem under rational expectations, okay? So there's gonna be no distortions here, no belief distortions. There's gonna be only choices of prices and allocations to maximize social welfare, quadratic approximation to social welfare. It consists of the usual terms, inflation output gap, and then the house price gap, okay? So this is the house price relative to its efficient level, okay? The QTU star, okay? And then we get an extended Euler equation. We're gonna talk about this before. And then we're gonna get an, the additional asset pricing equation, um, which is here written in gap form, which is essentially the asset pricing equation I've shown you in the, in the previous slide, okay? So let's first look at the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve now has the standard terms inflation, expected inflation output gap, but it now also has the house price gap, okay? So if the house price is larger then the efficient level of housing prices, say because of a housing subsidy, okay, suppose, okay, in this setting because of a housing subsidy, then this is gonna generate cost push terms, okay? Why is that? Well, for given level of output, if there is a higher house price, it means of the given level of output, I put more of the resources in housing investment, marginal utility of consumption goes up, that is real wages have to, have to increase okay, for given level of output. And, and that means uh, that, you know, marginal utility goes up, the first the intertemporal first order condition for wages is going to tell you real wages have to go up and that's going to be a cost push term as a result, okay? So that's pretty obvious. Now let's see what is this term doing? Well, under rational expectations, the house price in deviation from its efficient level is just the expected future discounted house price in deviation from its efficient level and well, look at this, it's just some constant times the housing subsidy, 
Okay, so the only thing that under rational expectations distorts the house price is the housing subsidy. But look, this is an exogenous thing. So this thing is going to be a constant. This thing is going to be a constant. This thing is going to be a constant. The only thing we get here is the constant term in the markup component. Okay, and if you then take first order conditions, you know, the only things that are endogenous are the well, are the black terms here and black terms here. You can see immediately how this problem under rational expectations with housing boils down to one where you get the usual target criterion for inflation and the output gap should be related in the way they usually are. Okay, so the only thing what's different is a little bit the definition of the housing gap, which now also depends on house price shocks, in particular, you know, shocks to housing demand and housing supply. Okay. All right, so this was the case. Under rational expectations, if you believe in rational expectations, there's really no need, you know, to do anything special about housing prices. Now, what changes in um, the case, uh, I've told you all this, what changes now in the case uh, with robustness concerns? <clears throat> um, well, there is one technical assumption that we have to make to get analytics, we basically have to assume that the, the endogenous variables are time invariant functions that load in time invariant ways on the set of structural shocks, okay? Plus some deterministic time zero component. This is not a restriction on the rational expectations, but um, it, it is somewhat restrictive in the case of robustness concerns, but this is what we need to get a closed form solution, okay? Okay, so now, what is key here in the approximation is that, you know, this cost that we associate with uh, penalizing belief distortions, we're going to assume it to be of second order. This was the, the Lagrangian, okay, the Lagrangian uh, on the cost of belief distortion in the objective function. And in the approximation that we're going to use, we're going to let this to be of second order. That's going to be key for getting first order effects in the structural equations from these belief distortions. We had in our prior work, this could be only a first order, so to go down less strong, so we're going to penalize basically belief distortions stronger in the limit, in, in, the, in the perturbation, and if, you, but now we're going to allow for these larger distortions, okay? Okay, so then what is it that we get? Well, now remember, the upper bound problem consisted of first choosing the belief distortions. These are the two Lagrange multipliers on those, you know, distortion constraints, okay? We have two expectations, inflation expectations and house price expectations, so we get a two-dimensional Lagrange uh, vector of Lagrange multipliers. So these are the distortions, and then subject to those distortions, we choose outputs, uh, housing prices and inflation to, make, uh, to minimize the loss coming out of the standard objective. Now this objective has three terms. It has the inflation term, the output gap term, and the house price gap term that we had previously under rational expectations. But now it also has the costs of belief distortions, okay? So belief distortions uh, enter quadratically, okay? And generate a cost, uh, it's costly to distort, okay? That's uh, basically a penalization. And the cost depends on this data, okay? So and if this data goes to zero at the second order, you, know, you can see already how we can then, you know, afford larger distortions, okay? So what about the new Keynes and Phillips curves? Well, it's going to look like in the rational expectations case, that's going to have also these cost push components that come from um, house price distortions, but now it has these distorted expectations, okay? And these distorted expectations are a function of these distortions that are chosen up here, okay? and some matrix, some vector V1, which is actually the first row of this matrix V, the square matrix two by two, two matrix, okay? And then there's gonna be an asset pricing equation. The asset pricing equation is gonna look like before, but it's gonna have this distorted housing price expectations, okay? Which are gonna be, you know, multiplied by V2, which is the second component here. So this looks like a linear quadratic problem, uh, but it's not, and the reason is that this V is an endogenous component of the model, okay? It's not exogenous. If this were an exogenous set of parameters, this would just, just be a linear quadratic problem, but it's not. It depends on the housing price surprises um, uh, and is an endogenous one, okay? So the good thing is that the V determines both, remember the V determines both the costs of distortions and the benefits of distortions, okay? 
So if you ask yourself what are the most harming distortions, they're going to not depend on V. Okay, you know, we depend on this endogenous object V. Okay, and uh, we can in fact show that um, that V is going to be the matrix of inflation surprises and housing price surprises in a color term. Okay, but as I told you, that thing that optimal choice of distortions is not going to depend on V. What is this going to be proportional to? Well, the Lagrange multiplies on the two constraints. So what does that mean? One of the distortions is going to be proportional to the Lagrange multiplier on the Phillips curve, and one is going to be proportional to the Lagrange multiplier on the asset pricing equation. So that means the worst case things you fear are the ones when these two constraints bite more, okay, the Phillips curve and the asset pricing equation, when they bite more for the policymaker, this is when you fear most of the distortions actually happening. Okay, this is what this intuitively says. Okay, so, and we're going to talk about what this means in economic terms in a second. Okay, so this is what it says the distortions are actually proportional to these two Lagrange multipliers on the Phillips curve and on the asset pricing equation. Now, you can put this into the objective function, okay, these worst case distortions, and then uh, derive uh, the optimal policy problem uh, for the follower, and then you're going to get this follow this sort of first order condition with respect to optimal inflation. It's going to have the Lagrange multipliers. It's going to lead up to the you know, change in the output gap and these inflation surprises and these housing price surprises. Okay. Okay. So this is how we get to our target criterion. Now let's propose a little bit. Let's look a little bit at this target criterion. Okay. The coefficient on the target criterion on the inflation surprises is some square terms of Lagrange multipliers on the Phillips curve. So that's always a positive thing. Okay, so this coefficient here is always going to be positive. But what about this? Well, this is going to be the covariance term between, well, some second, not exactly covariance if there were no mean, but it's uh, the expectation of the product of the Lagrange multipliers on the Phillips curve and the asset pricing equation. Okay. Um, now, what we're going to look at is a steady state in which the means of those things are both positive because we have an insufficient output subsidy. So you would like to, you know, generate more output in the okay, and where there is basically too high of a housing subsidy so that you have too many houses around, okay. And then if you don't have too many too large of fluctuations, then this product is going to be zero, okay. And as a result, we're going to get these positive coefficients. Now, why would you want to lean against house price surprises when there are too many houses and there's too low of an output, okay? What is it that you fear most? Well, you fear most situations in which you can distort house price expectations upwards at the same time that you can generate inflation, distort inflation expectations upwards. Suppose this were the case. So this is the case when, well, when housing price surprises and inflation surprises co-move positively. So if you have this positive co-movement between inflation surprises and house price surprises, then distorting upwards the probability of those states, you get two things for one. You in distort upwards inflation expectations and you distort upwards house price expectations. Why is that bad? Well, in a situation where output is already too low, if you distort upward inflation expectations in the Phillips curve, it generates additional downward pressure on output, so additional costs. <clears throat> in a situation where house prices are already too high, upward distortion in house price expectations is going to dis generate additional upward distortion in housing prices, and then this is going to lead to additional excess supply of housing. Okay, so you feel this positive correlation between house price surprises and inflation surprises because this allows for distortions that, the distortions that achieve two things at the same time. Okay. How you react as a policymaker? Well, you want to make these states less attractive. You engineer a less positive correlation between inflation surprises and housing price surprises by having positive coefficients on both of those co uh, uh, components in the targeting rule. So as a result, you make either inflation surprises and house price surprises less positively correlated or even negatively correlated. Okay. And that allows you not to distort 
both variables with one distortion in the unbeneficial uh, direction. Obviously, if you had, you know, one of those, if, you, if house prices were, you know, too low, uh, then you would lean with the wind, okay? So you can understand that now, if this were a negative number, okay? So house prices are basically too low because there are too few houses. You would like a positive correlation between inflation and house price surprises because if you want to distort upward inflation, that's bad for you because you get less output, but it's good for you because then you get higher house prices and therefore a better a higher supply of housing. Okay, so that's basically the logic uh, between this um, thing. So, Klaus, <clears throat> yeah. Klaus, um, can I ask a question? So you say sure. if um, inflation and the house prices are positive correlated, then it's good to to lean against the house price boom. Uh, so what it's about the last years, for example, so we haven't seen much of inflation surprises, but we have seen a big increase in house prices. So it's not that clear or on a first. So what do you think? So <laughs> well, if you're asking myself, negative are these <laughs> correlated because it's more driven mm -hmm. by a supply shock then, then of a demand shock or how, how do I have to think about it if I, yeah. Uh, you mean the recent years, you mean after the Great Recession or yes, before so, the Great Recession? Yeah, exactly. After the Great Recession? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, there certainly have been negative surprises to housing. <laughs> uh, there have been maybe also some negative surprises to inflation. Um, certainly around, I mean, over some horizon, there have been uh, negative surprises. Maybe some people, once the recession was ongoing, expected even larger uh, you know, deflation that we actually have experienced. Uh, but um, it's hard to say whether that is due to the reaction of monetary policy or something else. Uh, this is not a statement about, you know, um, whether these variables are correlated in a certain form or not. This is just saying, uh, maybe it's always the case that inflation surprises and house price surprises are negatively correlated, okay? This is just saying, conditionally on you experiencing a, a surprise to house prices, you're going to engineer a negative surprise inflation. What is the unconditional correlation to that? It's not implied by this targeting criterion. Okay, this targeting criterion does not anything directly imply anything about the data about how house prices and inflation are correlated. Okay, okay. so this is not this is just saying conditionally on how you respond to this thing happening. What's the actual correlation in, in the data is not implied by the targeting creator. Okay, you can easily see that you could, you know, depending on how you determine output uh, and inflation, uh, different things can happen. With this equation, I could easily complement. This is one equation in, uh, in three variables. It cannot possibly determine the co-variation in all the three variables alone. Okay. So, okay, so how come that uh, efficient house prices are not relevant here? And it seems the intuition is that those two distortions that you get in via the expectations re reinforce each other almost by construction. Is this the case? No, I think the reason, so in the welfare, in the welfare criterion, you noted that, that I think that's a very good question. So. The question is why here do we not have house prices relative to their efficient level, okay? Which is maybe what you would have expected to show up in, uh, in these expressions, okay? And it's particularly because in the objective function, if you go back to the, the monetary policy objective, you're gonna get that, you know, the, what the policymaker targets is the gap between in house prices and its efficient level, okay? It's going very slow. So here we have the, the deviation between house prices and its efficient level, okay? The reason is that the ability to distort this variable depends on, on this component. And this, for the ability to distort does depend only on how well you can distort the housing price and not the efficient level of the housing price, okay? And uh, if the housing price were a constant, Take of the limiting case, the housing price were a constant, but the efficient level fluctuates, okay? That means 
with the absolute continuity restriction that we impose on beliefs, you could not have possibly distorted house price expectations. Okay? It's becoming increasingly harder to distort a variable that has less and less variability. In the limit where it's just a constant, this would require you to believe what the constant is. And therefore, it's not you know, relevant what the gap is, but for the ability <laughs> to distort housing prices, how variable the variable itself is. And that's why that variable shows up in the targeting criteria. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's, you know, that's the result that you get, uh, the conditions under which you lean against housing prices or lean with housing prices depend on whether housing prices, you know, how house prices are distorted relative to the first best and how uh, output gap is distorted relative to its first best. In particular, the expectation of the, this covariance of this Lagrange multiplier that determines the sign of, of, of this uh, reaction coefficient. If that reaction coefficient is positive, which is the case if on average, you know, you have too low output and too high house prices relative to the first best, then this is going to be positive. If you get different configurations, both being to the other side, okay, too high output, too low house prices, then this would also be positive. But if you get the opposite configurations, then you would lean with well uh, in this framework. Okay, so th this is basically um, um, the economic determinants of whether you lean against or with housing prices. Now, somewhat unexpectedly, unless there are other questions, I do have um, some time for getting into a, a numerical example. Let me try if I can speed this up. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah, um, sure. So there's been uh, a line of literature that says that in a lot of the regions in the U.S. that experienced uh, really high increases in house prices, there was a lot of speculative activity of uh, people buying houses as investment properties or second homes. Um, would limiting the ability to buy second homes or investment properties to limit the supply in that sense have a similar effect? Or um, would that sort of operate through a different mechanism? Well, that's a you know that's in a in a representative agent model a very different question. Here, no one is buying to let, or if there were a housing market, a rental market, it would be indifferent uh, between renting and, and owning. Uh, right, but uh, you could essentially impose like a cap on the supply or something would be like a, a way to maybe yeah. better agent model. That's right. So if in this model, if you had if you had uh, an inelastic supply of housing, okay, right, which is basically what Bernanke and Gertler had in their analyses, they had mm -hmm. the asset was supplied, you know, the asset supply was fixed. The only thing that varied was the price of the asset, and then through collateral constraint, it generated demand effects. Okay, okay. Uh, and and but that price of that whatever the price was, the allocation in terms of the number of assets was fixed. If you did that here, then the concerns for robustness about housing price would go away because the housing price fluctuations here, if you had an inelastic supply, maybe because of policy or because of technology, doesn't matter, right? Then there would be no concerns why you would want to lean against housing prices. In fact, the only thing that would remain is the incentive to lean against inflation surprises, okay? okay. So the target criterion in that case, in that special case, would be the same as the one we have had here. Just that, the, oops, uh, that this coefficient would be zero, and the only thing that would generalize relative to the new gains model would be this part. Okay? okay. You still would be concerned about inflation expectation distortions. Okay. And that just says you want to limit the amount to which inflation fluctuates. Okay. That okay. would some, be something that survives. And the reason is, if you allow for larger inflation fluctuations. It's again easier to distort expectations about the meaning of that variable. Okay, uh, that's the the, uh, the the other story. A very you know noisy variable. You can distort more easily the mean of the expectation, and that's natural because it's harder to estimate what that mean is. You know, if the variable itself is more you know displays more variance. Okay, so that's then the thing that would survive. But obviously, if you could fix exogenously, say if you could fix the housing subsidy or to have it in a purely state contingent optimal way that would take into account the housing price expectations, the distortions, okay, of the housing price. If you correct, could correct to that, you would do better. Here, actually, we do not allow the house, the monetary policymaker, to react 
to the belief distortions. Okay. Okay. We do not, because, you know, remember the setup was one that you first commit to your policy and then the belief distortions are chosen. It's only this other problem that we compute for the upper bound that, okay. that we, that's a technical trick. But here you are not allowed to condition directly on the belief distortions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you could do that, you would do better because you would effectively make yourself second mover. Okay. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had other policy instruments at hand that would achieve that, that would obviously be better because you get additional instruments and you could use the existing interest rate instrument to do other things better, like stabilizing more inflation. Okay, thank you. Okay, but since we are at this stage, um, then the obvious question is now many central banks have macroprudential policy and shouldn't we then reserve the interest rate policy for standard stuff and use one of the other tools? That's right. I mean, um, that's a good, a very good question. <laughs> I mean, you could say that you could limit the supply that comes from, um, from housing um, distortions, housing price distortions, the supply distortions that come from price distortions through other means like leverage ratios, debt to income uh, constraints or other things. To the extent that works, that's obviously good. If you have more instruments, that's going to allow for additional better objectives if those don't create other problems. Um, here the task is, you know, uh, to determine what, if those instruments are not deployed for some reason, uh, what could you do with uh, monetary policy? But this is certainly a complementary uh, thing. Uh, the evidence suggests that those instruments seem to have surprisingly little bite. <laughs> uh, that, that's uh, certainly, you know, in, in places they have been deployed, like in Hong Kong and other places, it was surprisingly little effect uh, on, on uh, house price dynamics. Um, now, um, of course, you could argue that maybe also um, uh, the ability of the interest rate to affect the house price in a boom may be limited. Uh, this is a, ultimately an empirical question. But clearly, from a pure theory point of view, if you had additional, if you had additional instrument, that's always better. And I, I just try to explain how this would sort of affect the analysis. You would get rid of the house price the price term and only inflation price term would survive to the extent that you could fully eliminate those distortions with additional instruments. If something remains, then still some, maybe with a lower coefficient, um, uh, as the supply elasticity, in fact, converges to zero, so will then this coefficient converge to zero if, so to the extent that you can limit supply distortions with other instruments, then this term become less relevant in the targeting room. Well, I think now we do not have time for any <laughs> So uh, that's all right, um, um, but um, maybe there's one more question, or um, if not, any um, further questions? So let me then briefly wrap up. Um, so um, okay, so this is a model where you know, in the presence of these housing subsidies and inefficiently low output, you get um, uh, leaning against the wind as part of. The optimal commitment policy that means you would target a lower inflation rate or a lower output gap when the housing price happens to be unexpectedly high and symmetrically uh, you know higher inflation rate and a higher output gap um, when the housing price is unexpectedly low and um, you know the good thing in some sense is uh, that the central bank doesn't have to establish a view on what the housing price distortion is in the economy. It just needs to compare the housing price outcome relative to its efficient level, uh, relative to its predicted level in the previous period. Every time there's a positive surprise, you tighten. Every time there's a negative surprise, you are a little loser, okay? Now, the obvious question is, of course, you know, would this have required raising interest rates more or sooner in the mid 2000s? That's ultimately an empirical question. And admittedly, the paper, you know, the setup in the paper is still very stylized, which is motivated by the desire to get some analytic results. So the only concern that you have here for, you know, why you should be worried about high rising house prices is that it generates an oversupply of housing, which certainly was an issue in the housing boom in the US, but it was certainly not the only issue. 
And there were other issues such as, you know, the effects of overborrowing and effects on balance sheets of banks and households that came along with the house price expansions and its reversal. And of course, an open question is to what extent do these concerns push policy in actually the same direction? You could easily imagine that initially, you know, the, the most harming, the most harming belief distortion is the same, you know, you generate an expansion in house prices and that would then lead to an expansion of the balance sheets, okay? But once you have achieved a sufficiently large expansion, it could actually be that the most harming belief distortions are one that then suddenly revert and, you know, depress house price expectations in order to inflict some loss on the banking sector, in order to inflict some um, loss on the household's balance sheets. And so that, uh, you know, what is the worst case sort of could vary with the amount of credit around, not only with the amount of houses being around. And that could generate, um, you know, additional interesting dynamics, which are presently not in, in this analysis. It's something that you may be looking at in the future. Okay, so thank you, Klaus. Um...